Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 12, verse 31, to seek his kingdom above anything that the world has to offer, whether people, possessions, position, or power. This was followed by some practical teaching on what it means to seek first Christ's kingdom. This led to his teaching on the necessity to always live ready for his return. When Jesus spoke this truth, the idea that disciples must live like servants that strive to please their master was something they understood since that was part of their culture. At that time, they weren't able to grasp what Jesus meant by his returning, since he hadn't yet died, rose again, and ascended into heaven. He then gave a couple of parables to illustrate our need to live ready at all times. We end our last lesson with the opening of the parable that begins in verse 42. Who then is a faithful and wise manager, whom the master put in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? The word manager in this parable is more accurately translated as steward, and this is a position in a wealthy man's household. Since the position of steward is an ancient concept, many modern translations use the word manager to help people understand what Jesus was teaching. We see from this verse that a steward took care of the master's finances, at least to the point to take care of the household and to make sure that his fellow servants were well provided for. Now we will pick up with verse 43, that's a continuation of the parable. The verse reads, It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. This is just a repeat of what the Lord said in the three prior parables that were all about living ready to meet the master at any time of the day or night, regardless of how long he delays his return. Jesus is repeating himself a lot in these verses for a very good reason. He was warning his little sheep that they must live ready at all times if they want to be pleasing to the master and receive a rich welcome from him when he returns. We are naturally rebels that have wandering hearts and craving desires, so Jesus needed to press his thought home very strongly. The disciples might have asked why Jesus was pushing this point so hard, but the Lord knows us and knows our propensity to wander. It's love that warns, and Jesus was showing us much love through his teaching to help us be mindful of our weakness and sinful tendencies. It will truly be good for those who are faithful to the end who discharge their duties like good soldiers of Jesus Christ and faithfully obey whatever command like a much-loved servant. It will be good for that steward when the master returns for two reasons. First, there will be no need for any discipline or judgment upon him. Second, because a faithful steward will receive from the master a great reward, and we see this in the next verse. In verse 44, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. From this it appears that the steward was originally given limited authority over the master's household. This would be very wise on the part of the master, since the steward hadn't proven himself or exposed the real condition of his character. Sometimes stewards were hired freemen, and at other times they were slaves that showed themselves capable, such as in the case with Joseph. Some educated slaves were bought at a very high price. In either of the cases, the man had to prove himself faithful, which allowed the master to entrust him with more. This is how it works with the kingdom of God. The Lord is looking for men and women He can trust to faithfully discharge the duties of their calling. After we faithfully serve to the capacity of the calling, then the Lord may trust us with more. People that get positions within church, ministry, or denominations that don't have a seasoned character are put in a very dangerous place since they haven't been proved. The worldly concept of success has crept into the church where greater positions of power and prestige are sought after like worldly people seek after political power or high-powered positions in corporate America. Success within the kingdom of God is all about obedience and faithfulness to what the Lord has called us to be and do. The Lord doesn't determine success according to one's position, size of the church, or personal income. Our goal must be for the well done at the end of life and not seeking after feelings of worldly accomplishment that are meaningless and a chasing after the wind. In the parable, the Lord said that the faithful man would be put in charge of all the master's possessions. What this means in relation to eternal life, we have no way of knowing. The point is simple. The Lord always rewards those who are faithful to Him. Some saints will begin to experience that reward while they are on earth. Others will know it only after they see Jesus face to face. The spiritual law that we reap what we sow is an absolute, and this is further expressed in the next verse, but in a negative way. But suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time coming, 
and then begins to beat the men servants and maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The minimum treasure the Lord has entrusted to every person is their own life, and every rational person will give an account to God for what they did with that life. Now add to this that we will answer to God for how we have treated every person in our life, and we begin to see the seriousness of the situation. In this verse, the parable takes a sobering turn to address those who abuse the trust the Lord has given them. The context of the parable makes a servant a part of the household of the master. This corresponds with those who are followers of Jesus. Given that the man abused his fellow servants and lived a debauched life, he was in a backslidden condition and abusing himself and others through the pursuit of sin. The parable could also be applied to people in general who live contrary to God's will, and this can go in a lot of different directions. In the parable we see a servant who believes a lie that the master will not shortly return. This leads to the next lie, that he wouldn't incur any negative consequences for living in disobedience to the master's will. All the problems begin with a lie and are multiplied through more lies, and this is a significant point. The first sin ever committed was to believe a lie, and this is exactly what Lucifer did, and that's why Jesus called him the father of lies in John chapter 8, verse 44. Believing a lie led to pride, and pride led to rebellion. Judgment fell with Satan being expelled from heaven, and will finally end in the lake of fire. This same process took place with Eve. Satan, in disguise as a serpent, lied to Eve, and when she believed the lie, she gave birth to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. What did believing these lies produce? Rebellion that produced death and separation from God, and would finally end in the lake of fire if she didn't repent, and we have no biblical evidence that she did. This pattern keeps going on through human history and in our own personal history. This is why it's vitally important that we become lovers of the truth, so that we break the pattern of believing lies, which always leads to rebellion against God. In the parable, we read the phrase that the servant said to himself, and this is very similar to the parable of the rich fool that said a lot of foolish things to himself, all of which led to rebellion against God. In both parables, we are given a picture of self-rule that always produces rebellion against God's rule. Self-rule is built upon lies. These lies are perversions of the truth. Because God gave us a free will doesn't mean we are to abuse this precious gift by turning it into an expression of self-rule that's an act of rebellion against God. Our free will was given to us so that we could choose to love and obey the Lord. But when we believe lies of any sort, they are going to produce in us the works of the flesh that will bring spiritual death. It's only when we choose to believe the truth and then to put the truth into practice that we begin to know the life of Christ working in and through us. The lies the servant believed in the parable eventually produced a lifestyle that was hostile to the master and abusive to himself and his fellow servants. There's a pattern here that we need to see. By believing the lie that the master delays his coming and that he wouldn't be judged for his actions produced a wicked character of self-indulgence and abuse. People don't end up living a self-indulgent life overnight. It grows like a terrible weed in the heart, mind, and soul that poisons the person and turns him or her into abuser. This all comes closer to home than we want to admit. Just look at the breakdown of marriage. This doesn't happen in a moment, but over time. Hurt by hurt, wound by wound, a husband and wife abuse each other through words, anger, bitterness, unfaithfulness, and at times even physical abuse. When you look at how this happens, you will find that they believe lie upon lie upon lie that cause greater rebellion against God and in turn produce more abuse against those whom they should have loved and protected. Tear down the lies and you will see the evil demons that were working behind the scenes and how a husband and wife destroyed their marriage by letting filthy devils whisper in their ears and produce pride and rebellion in them. There's endless examples of this as seen in the life of every person. These smart devils keep speaking into the ears of mankind, and we foolishly keep listening until the truth and wisdom of God breaks this demonic spell upon us. Another thing we see from what Jesus said in verse 44 is how there's no such thing as secret or hidden sin. The sin we practice will always be revealed in how we act towards others. This is also true when people pursue a life of righteousness. They will begin to treat others through the love and mercy of God. The lie the steward believed that he wouldn't have to answer to the master is shown to be a lie in verse 46 that states, The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. It's strange how we can believe lies and think that they are actually the truth. If the truth breaks into our lives, it will expose the lies for what they really are. 
What we do next will determine our eternal destiny. Notice that the judgment upon the steward was that he was assigned a place with unbelievers. This tells us that the steward wasn't numbered among unbelievers when he was given that position. Plain and simple, the man was a backslider. The master wouldn't have put a wicked person in charge of his household, so the spiritual and moral condition of the man was the byproduct of believing lies that eventually led him to forsaking the Lord altogether. To cut a person in pieces was a Middle Eastern and Eastern form of execution. Jesus was using this to paint a graphic picture of what happens to people that rebel against the Master. Not that the Lord literally cuts people into pieces, but that severe judgment falls upon the unfaithful. The worst aspect of the judgment is that the man who once had the Master's favor would never have it again after the judgment fell upon him, and would forever be subject to the judgment of the wicked. This parable was certainly aimed at Christ's disciples to help them count the cost of their salvation and to not let the lies of hell get a grip upon their heart and mind. Jesus is coming back, and this fact is based upon the unchangeable character of God and His Word. We don't know the day or the hour when this will happen, and this was done on purpose so that each generation of believers would live ready. There is a final generation with the history of mankind on this material world. And with each passing day, we are getting closer to the time when Jesus will rend the heavens and come again. I believe this is the final generation, and I want to live like it until I see Jesus coming in the clouds or die, and the next moment I'm in his presence. Either way, I win, and in both cases, I must be faithful to the end, just like you need to do. The point in verse 46 that the steward was a backslider is strongly reinforced in verse 47. That servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. Here we find a servant that believes certain lies that caused him to rebel against the master. The man knew his master's will, and this belongs only to those who are truly saved. The world doesn't know God's will or knows it only according to conscience and not by divine revelation through the word of God and by saving grace. The rebellion of the servant is demonstrated in two ways. First, he deliberately doesn't get ready for Christ's return or for his destiny with death. This tells us that the man knew that he was to live a holy life in relationship with Jesus, but refused to do so, either by willfully neglecting what he should have done or by purposely doing what he knew he ought not to do. The second way is that he purposely refused to obey the will of God that he knew. In either case, the man is in rebellion against God. Now we need to determine the spiritual condition of the servant. Was he an unsaved man or a backslider? Did his disobedience take him outside of salvation where he would suffer divine judgment, or was he being disciplined as a son? I would venture to say that the man was outside of salvation, that he was a backslider. The man's rebellion produced severe judgment, not discipline. The Mosaic law limited the number of lashes a man could be beaten with to forty. The Romans whipped people with a scourge that had nine leather lashes to it and had a piece of stone or bone attached to the ends to do more damage to the person's body. The Jews laid more lashes on a person by giving 40 lashes per offense, so 80 lashes could be laid on a person when found guilty of two crimes. Those who committed severe crimes received the greater number of lashes. Those who knew Christ and backslid are guiltier of greater sin than those who never knew him. Therefore, their judgment would be all the more severe. Paul stated in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6, that they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Backsliding is a terrible sin. In verse 48, Jesus went on to say, but the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From every one who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. The first point of this verse is about those who are ignorant of Jesus and the way of salvation. Since they are lawbreakers, they will be judged for breaking God's law and for violating their conscience where they knew to do right but refused to do it. Though they are still guilty of breaking God's law, they did not know the one who made those laws and won't receive a severe judgment as a backslider. God will execute judgment, and it will be based upon absolute truth, since he knows the thoughts and motives of every person and was an eyewitness of their crimes because he is omnipresent. We aren't wise enough to understand how God judges and must be careful not to misrepresent him by turning him into a heartless severe deity or by making him to be a weak being that tolerates sin and evil. 
We would do well to bow to the God of all mysteries because we don't know how he executes justice and we need to rest in the fact that he is infinitely holy and good. Those cast into hell deserve divine judgment for the crimes they committed against God and people. They are guilty of anarchy by rejecting Jesus and rebelling against his kingdom and this is a more severe sin than we understand. And all those who gain salvation and eternal life do so only because they threw themselves upon the mercy of God and obtained saving grace by believing the promises of God. This brings us to the point Jesus made that everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Jesus clarifying his prior points by declaring that people will be judged according to the light or spiritual knowledge they have and what they did with that knowledge. Those who have been given much light or had the opportunity of receiving much from God but refused to seek after it will be proportionally punished for the light that they abused or neglected to seek after. Those who received less light yet violated the light they were given will be punished according to the knowledge that they possessed. This gives us to understand that in hell each person will suffer according to their crimes. Now I don't know what that means because I don't know how God will judge each person and what eternal judgment actually looks like. In Luke chapter 20, verse 47, Jesus declared to the Pharisees, Sadducees, priests, and teachers of the law that they would receive greater damnation. Why? Because they were keeping people from entering the kingdom of God through their erroneous teaching and hostility against Messiah. Greater damnation equals greater severity of punishment. False teachers, preachers, and prophets that teach lies will be judged more strictly as a result. Why? Because false teachers kept people from salvation by teaching lies. Fallen angels will receive an even greater damnation because of the light that they had was greater than mere mortals. They were privileged to dwell in God's presence, and when they spurned that privilege through rebellion, they brought upon themselves divine judgment in proportion to the heinous nature of their sin. There's a gross and dangerous doctrinal error I want to briefly address that uses verses 47 and 48 and also 57 and 58. This is a lie concerning purgatory that the Catholic Church advances along with its various denominational offshoots. They use these verses to support the false doctrine that will damn multitudes to hell. People believe that if they are baptized in the Catholic Church that they will eventually get into heaven after spending some time in purgatory to burn off their sins. Water baptism in essence becomes a license of sin and purgatory the purifier that readies people for heaven. They believe that their stay in purgatory depends upon the nature of their sins and how much money they had paid in indulgences to decrease the sentence. This false doctrine degrades Christ's atonement and the power of his blood to cleanse from sin. They make what Jesus did on the cross inadequate, that it's not enough, that it wasn't a finished work like Jesus said from the cross. Hell or purgatory must then finish the work Jesus failed to accomplish on Calvary. Did you hear that? That's a terrifying thought. The doctrine of purgatory came from hell to take people to hell. This false doctrine also perverts what the New Testament teaches about the necessity of being born again to enter the kingdom of God, which then opens the door to receive Christ's transforming grace that is absolutely radical. Jesus changes the subject in verse 49, stating, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. It's nearing the time for Jesus to be offered up as our atoning sacrifice. He's yearning for its completion so that the fullness of salvation can come to the people and that he can send the promised Holy Spirit. The Greek word translated as bring in this verse is more accurately translated as cast and refers to the act of causing a state or condition. It's like casting a burning torch in a dry forest to set the forest on fire. Jesus said that he was longing to cast a Holy Spirit fire on the earth. This is not only the baptism of the Holy Spirit that was poured out on the day of Pentecost, but a holy fire that will set the people of God ablaze for the glory of God. Many people that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit don't have a fire burning in them because they never use the gift to set that fire burning. It's not the problem of the Spirit baptism, but of its neglect or abuse. John the Baptist prophesied about this baptism in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Let me share a story of revival to illustrate my point that comes from the book, The Kneeling Christian. It was written by an unknown author that traveled to India, possibly as a missionary, and while there he visited a Christian boarding school that taught 1,500 Hindu girls. One day some of these girls went to the missionary with their Bibles, 
and asked what Luke chapter 12, verse 49 meant. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and what will I if it's already kindled? The missionary tried to put them off with an evasive answer because she didn't know, but the girls weren't satisfied, so they determined to pray for this fire. What a great idea! As they prayed, the fire of God fell, and they were given their own Pentecost. This set the girls on fire and compelled them to continue praying. A group of these girls traveled to a mission station and asked the missionary if they could pray for their work. The missionary wasn't happy over the idea of these girls gadding about the country when they ought to be in school. They only asked for a hall or barn where they could pray and was finally given permission. As the day progressed and the evening came on, strange things began to happen. A native pastor came to the missionary, completely broke down, and explained while weeping that the Holy Spirit had convicted him of sin and that he had to openly confess it. This was followed one after another of professing Christians that went to the missionary under deep conviction of sin to repent. There was a remarkable time of blessing where backsliders were restored, believers were sanctified, and heathen were brought to salvation. Why? Because a few children were baptized in the Holy Spirit in fire, and they prayed that holy fire down upon that mission station and surrounding area. The American church is in desperate need of this baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire. Yes, even the Pentecostal church. Without the empowering work of the Holy Spirit, we won't have holy fire burning inside of us or through us. And we won't get the Spirit baptism with fire until we are willing to be like those children that began seeking for this with holy desperation. We must also add to this our great need to have this simple childlike faith that they had that will see the windows of heaven open and pour out upon us a baptism with fire. When that fire falls, then it must be maintained through prayer, the study of the Word, fellowship, worship, and zeal for God's glory through the discipling of the saints and reaching the lost. This is the active part we are to play in God's work of salvation that can only be done through the free gift of divine grace. Verse 50 presents God's work of salvation. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it's completed. The baptism Jesus is talking about is a bloody baptism of suffering that he would soon experience. But what exactly is this baptism? It's far more than suffering in general or even of martyrdom. James, John, and their mama asked Jesus to have her boys sit on his right and left in his kingdom. In other words, James wanted to be the prime minister and John the secretary of state, not humble requests from mama's two darling boys. Jesus responded in Matthew chapter 20, verse 22, You don't know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Some really arrogant young men here. Then, verse 23, Jesus replied, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. What was the cup Jesus, James, and John would drink from? The cup of suffering, and they all did drink from it. But the baptism Jesus is talking about is different. Only Jesus could experience this. No mere mortal could withstand its horror and weight. Though some theologians limit this baptism to Christ's suffering or martyrdom, there's much more to it because he is the Lamb of God. As the Lamb of God, Jesus would bear upon his sacred shoulders the sins of the world and be inundated with God's judgment as a result. This was a baptism of divine wrath, of the justice of God being directed at the sinless Son who became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. The Father rejected the Son not as a Son, but in our place. He received the judgment we justly deserve. In the 1984 NIV, the translation wrote that Jesus said, And how distressed I am until it is completed. Instead of distress, the King James Version used straightened, but I don't think in either of those translations they use the best word. The Greek word means to hold together, either by compressing or by not letting something fly apart. Figuratively, it means to compel, perplex, afflict, or constrain. And I think constrain is probably the best word to convey what Jesus is teaching. The Lord was burdened to finish the work He was sent to accomplish. This was pressing upon Him, and He was feeling the force or pressure to see its completion. A good illustration I read compared the burden Jesus was experiencing with a woman who is great with child and longs for the hour of her travail. She's not longing to suffer the pain of childbirth, which must come, but for her own relief and the joy she will know when her child is born into the world. Jesus wasn't longing to be betrayed by Judas, to be condemned by the religious elite, 
to be beaten, scourged, and mocked, and then condemned by Pilate. He wasn't longing for the pain of crucifixion or of having all the sins of mankind placed upon him and then to suffer the wrath of the Father. He was longing for resurrection day, where he would obtain victory over death, hell, and Satan for the sake of those who would be born to the kingdom of God. Then, and only then, would he be able to send the promised Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit that was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Jesus then said something in verses 51 through 53 that's astounding. Do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. The peace Jesus is referring to here is an internal peace, but relational peace. Those who make peace with God through repentance may find that they are at odds with those who have not. Did Jesus want this division? Yes, given that we live in a wicked world. The Lord wants people to be saved. He knows that when this happens, that they will be rejected by family and friends. The Lord is willing to divide families that some of them might be saved. It's not that He likes that division, but it's a necessary outcome of the kingdom of God invading a world in rebellion. Jesus would rather have a family tore apart so that some are saved instead of having to damn an entire family to hell. It's God's will that everyone would be saved, but we know that most of mankind will reject His salvation. Those who reject God's salvation are the ones who cause the division. The Lord will divide families and communities to save a few. This is a loving act by God to save those who want His salvation. We can't blame God because people reject His mercy. Even godly families can be divided because some of them refuse to serve the Lord. Jesus gives life to all those who believe, and those who have His life can give it to others. Those who reject God's life abide in death and give their spiritual death to others. We shouldn't be shocked or offended because those who hate God hate those who love God. Jesus warned us that this would happen. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. So come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing waters Bear away your guilt Lay down your burdens On a beautiful shore Come wash in the river Come be 